morning. Just came back from Japan two nights ago, and I am not sure how my English, English is going to do. So it's going to take a little while for me to get used to it. So please bear with me. And uh, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I'm going to read this in NIV. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I'm going to read this in NIV. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though The world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The word came flesh, became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, this was he whom, I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's house, has made him known. Word of God. Amen. Please bow with me for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we are going through this time of transition. During this season, Lord, I do ask that you would help us to examine ourselves and just reestablish our foundations in you. Uh, Lord, as we come before you, we do ask that you would speak to us, speak to each one of us this morning. And Lord, could, could you cleanse us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Son? And we welcome you here, and would you take your place amongst us? Lord, would you come as the Holy Spirit and anoint each one of us and speak to us. I give this time into your hands, and in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Um, well, uh, I, as I was introduced, um, my name is Reverend Daniel Kim. I'm a missionary. Um, I was sent out from the U.S. to, um, uh, to China, to Beijing, uh, my ministry that I started uh, about 13 years ago has to do with uh, me uh, equipping Chinese underground church leaders and sending them off to um, the Arab countries, the Middle East. And after spending five years in China, I came out to um, Korea and Japan. And ever since then, I've been traveling to different places, um, sharing the gospel, furthering his kingdom, and equipping his people. Um, like I said earlier, um, I just came back from Japan two nights ago. Uh, it hasn't, hasn't even been 48 hours since I came back, so I'm not sure how I'm going to do with my English. But uh, it's been a while since I preached in English, so bear with me. Uh, it's going to pick up as time goes on. You, you all know exactly what, what, what that means, right? Because once you go back to the U.S., somehow your English doesn't come out. Does that ever happen to you? Anyways... Um, I am aware that you guys, um, as church, is going through 
a very important season of transition. And I think this is a time for us to really uh, look into ourselves, not just looking outside, but looking into ourselves and ask ourselves, how am I? By the way, I really like the word shalom because um, that's actually the first word, one word that Jesus actually spoke to his disciples when he was resurrected. He came to, he came to his disciples and he asked, shalom. Uh, we, we all think, okay, that, that was just, just a regular way of saying hello back in those times. But just like, uh, just like in English, uh, we don't just ask, right? When we say, hey, how are you? There's a pattern to it. There's a formula to it. So we just, you know, we were, we're, we're used to that question. So we just answer, uh, well, I'm fine. Thank you, Andrew. We don't really care about how other person is doing. It's just almost like a formula. You ask, you answer. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Andrew. But if you really care to know how the other person is doing, you pause and you ask again. No, really, how are you? That's exactly what Jesus is doing after he was resurrected. Shalom. No, no, really. How, how are you really doing? Jesus is actually concerned about us. How are you? Really, how's it going? How are you doing spiritually? Not just missions, not just uh, mercy ministries, not uh, trying to carry on what we have, but he's really asking us, how are you doing, really? So, So the question that we want to ask is, Do I have eternal life? I think this is a good place to start. Do I have eternal life? I'm not talking about whether I go to church or not. I'm not talking about whether you like Jesus or not. I'm not talking about you've been coming to church and you've been a Christian for, you know, uh, since the time of birth. I'm not talking about you've actually said that right prayer, uh, accepting Jesus Christ into your heart. But I'm talking about do you have eternal life? At one point, do you remember Jesus said, not everyone who calls me a Lord, Lord, will be able to enter the kingdom of heavens. So just because you said the right words, that doesn't guarantee your entrance into the kingdom of heavens. In fact, a lot of times, um, in fact, Jesus said, some of you will come to me and say, Lord, in your name, I've healed uh, these people. In your name, I've cast out demons. In your name, you know, I've um, uh, made this miracle to happen. But on that last day, Jesus is going to say, I don't even know you. But English translation, actually, uh, it's actually um, rendered more accurately. Um, It says, I never knew you. You know what that means? All those times you were ministering in my name, all those times you've been coming to church in my name, I've never known you. It's a scary thing, don't you think? So before we go go on any further, there's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Am I even saved? Do I have eternal life? Am I really a Christian? Am I really the follower of Jesus Christ? Well, um, Pastor Daniel, I'm a ministry leader, and uh, I've been coming to church all my life, um, and I think this is a question that, you know, that probably uh, is probably more appropriate to the newcomers, probably not to me. But you know what Apostle Paul says? In 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you're truly in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So it is our Christian duty over and over from season to season, we examine our faith because Everything that we do really matters because we have eternal life. If we don't have eternal life, nothing we do matters. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross. Why? So that we may have eternal life. It's that important. So everything we do has to do with eternal life. Am I even saved? Am I really the children of God? Am I really the follower of Jesus Christ? Do I have eternal life? So that's the question that we want to ask this morning. In order to answer that question, there are three more questions that we want to ask. In order to understand, in order to see whether I have eternal life, 
three things that we want to ask ourselves. Number one, do I know Jesus Christ? Number two, do I accept Jesus Christ? Have I accepted Jesus Christ? Number three, do I believe in Jesus Christ? So three questions. So number one, do I know Jesus Christ? In verse through five, uh, one through five, um, I'm going to actually give you a chance to read, okay, since I read earlier. Um, this is your chance to shine, okay? Verses one through five. Ready? Let's read this one more time. This is day and age where we can't even read the scripture together uh, unless the PPT comes up. Okay, ready? Go. Amen. And verse 10 says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. When Jesus came to the world, there were people that actually had conversations with him. With him. There were people that actually sat and, uh, sat and uh, ate and drank with him. There were people that actually knew about Jesus. There were people that could actually say, you know, I know Jesus. But the Bible actually says very clearly, the world did not know him. The world did not recognize him. So what does that mean? What does it mean to know Jesus Christ? Well, um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you what that means. Uh, according to the Bible, the word to know first has to do with, do you recognize him as a Christ? Do you recognize him as a Christ? Um, at one point, Jesus actually um, said this. Uh, people came to Jesus and asked, Lord, um, sir, teacher, I want to follow after you, but first, let me go bury my father. And do you, do you remember what Jesus said? He says, let the dead go bury their own dead. And I was wondering, as a little kid, reading that passage, I was thinking, okay, maybe Jesus is not really all into the burial service or the funeral you know, ceremony or whatnot. And uh, more I read that passage, I began to understand what Jesus was trying to say. Let the dead go bury, them, uh, bury their own dead. That means if you're truly alive, if you are truly alive as you claim, your, claim yourself to be, and if you can really see who I am and recognize me, you won't be able to say, let me go first do that. Therefore, since you don't recognize me, you're probably dead spiritually. Go bury, their own, go, go bury your own father. Do you recognize him as a Christ? There's so many things that we uh, uh, put out there on the table, uh, conditions, when we uh, serve the Lord, when we want to follow after Jesus Christ. We say, let me go first, get that promotion. Let me go first, take care of my family. Let me go first, uh, be faithful to my work. Let me go first, do that. Let me go first, be, uh, be mindful of my family. But all those things are important, but Jesus Christ actually said, seek his kingdom and his righteous first. And all these things will be added on to you. Yeah, there is a balance, but the fact that we can actually say, let me go first do that. Let me go first finish my education. Let me go first uh, get, get, uh, get settled down. The fact that we can say that actually proves only one thing. You know what that is? You probably know about Jesus, but you haven't really recognize who Jesus Christ is. You haven't recognized him as the Christ. That's what it means to know Jesus. If you really know Jesus, your life's going to be affected by that. A lot of us, we know exactly how to worship. For example, I uh, go to different uh, conferences. A lot of youth, a lot of young people get together. Uh, we like to worship, right? And spotlight comes on and all the lights goes off. Smoke machine, machine it, it, you know, it starts smoking up all this fog. And all these kids, they come up to the stage and start jumping, right? And I, one, one day I was looking at them, I began to realize, that's exactly like the Pavlov's dog. I'm sorry for saying that, but that's exactly what I felt. Because I asked one of the kids, jumping right next to me, say, like, why are you jumping? You know what he says? I don't know. Everybody's jumping, so I'm jumping too. <laughs> this is a song to jump. 
And I was thinking, these people, a lot of them, are reacting to the cue, just like the Pavlov's dog. Do you remember what kind of experience Pavlov did uh, before he gave, uh, before he fed the dog, he rang the bell. And after doing that for, such a, for a certain amount of time, the dog understands the cue. And when he hears the bell, it starts to salivate. That's exactly how modern Christianity is going on these days. We know exactly how to react to certain songs. We know exactly how to react to certain words. We know exactly how to say the right words. We know exactly how to act like Christians. That's why we know exactly how to be, how to, uh, how to be, to um, have that, how do you say it, the appearance of godliness. But do you have that essence? Do you have that power of the Holy Spirit? Do you have the presence of God? Is, is your life really transformed? Carry your cross and follow after Jesus. You know what that means? People who actually responded to the calling of Jesus Christ, their life was affected. Their life was transformed. And not just them, but the world was transformed because of them. So, what does the gospel mean to you? Do you recognize him as a Christ? If you recognize him as a Christ, uh, if you, 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 to know Jesus Christ doesn't only mean you recognize him as a Christ, but you, you, you also acknowledge him as a Christ. You acknowledge him as a Christ, and that's when your life gets really affected by uh, the, the, the truth uh, of the gospel. Um, C.S. Lewis. My, one of my favorite authors, um, he actually said, there's the three possibilities. If you really look at the Bible, you can't, you can't dismiss Jesus Christ as uh, just a good teacher because there's a lot of controversial things that he talks about um, in his teachings, right? For example, you must hate your father and mother uh, in, order to, uh, in order to follow me uh, so that there's no misunderstanding. I'm just going to clarify that. He's not actively, he's not teaching us to actively hate our father and mother or brothers and sisters, but he's saying relatively hate your father and mother and brothers and sisters because of your love towards God is so great. That love for your parents will look like hatred. That's what it means. So if you look at the Bible, there's a lot of things that could, at least on the surface, it looks very controversial. So if you really read the Bible, you can't dismiss Jesus Christ as someone, oh, he's, he was a great guy, he was a great man, he was a great teacher. The fact that you can say that, the fact that a lot of people can say that, they really don't care about what the Bible is saying. They've probably never read it. But if you really read it, there's three possibilities to Jesus Christ's identity. Number one, maybe he was a liar. Number two, maybe he was a lunatic. Number three, Indeed, he was the Lord as he claims himself to be. So, for, for, for the sake of time, I'm not going to get, get, uh, uh, get into details of um, C.S. Lewis's uh, uh, argument, but we all know that he's the Lord, right? Amen? Amen? We all know that he's the Lord. Well, I think he's a lunatic. That's why I'm here to worship him. We all know he's the Lord. He's the Lord. But you know what? If you really acknowledge him as the Lord, you realize that we're in big trouble. Because if he's truly the Lord as he, as he claims himself to be, that means everything in the Bible must be true. If everything in the Bible must be true, that means one and only God, the creator himself, came in flesh to die for our sins. If he's truly the Lord himself as he claims himself, claims himself to be, that means he's going to be the judge who's going to judge us one day with justice. If you really acknowledge him as a Christ, as the creator God, as Yahweh himself, if you really recognize and acknowledge him, you know what that means? Your life will never be the same. Your worship's going to be different. Your dedication's going to be different. Your offering's going to be different. The way we uh, revere God's going to be different. Every single aspect of our lives is going to be affected by that. But the fact that our lives are not affected by that maybe proves one thing. Yeah, we know about Jesus. We like Jesus. We prefer Jesus over other gods. But maybe 
we don't recognize him or, or we don't even acknowledge him as the Christ. So that's a, that's a question that we want to ask ourselves. Do we really recognize him? Do we really acknowledge him as the Christ? In one word, do I know him? See, if, unless you know him like that on the last day, Jesus is going to tell you, I don't know you. Because you, you don't even recognize me. You just treated me as one of, you know, the people that you prefer. So the first question, do you recognize him? Do you acknowledge him? Do you know Jesus Christ? Number two, second question, do you accept Jesus Christ? Let's read from verses 11 through 13. Let's read verses, from ver- verses 11 through 13. Are you ready? Okay, ready, go. We um, a lot of times misunderstand this passage. We think uh, accepting Jesus has to do with um, uh, saying the prayer of acceptance. Um, A lot of times it goes on like this. Um, Do you accept Jesus Christ? And, you know, after hearing the five-minute gospel message, you say, oh, yeah, I want to accept Jesus Christ. And uh, you you say, okay, then follow after me, because since you probably have no idea how to pray, I'm going to lead your prayer just one phrase at a time. Why don't you repeat what I say? But say it sincerely. And then we pray, Father God, Father God, um, I open my heart. I open up my heart. Please come into my heart. Please come into my heart. Please be my Lord and Savior. Please be my Lord and Savior. I want to go to heaven. I want to be your child. Uh, thank you for coming to my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And what do, we, what do we say? Now that you accepted Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. Since when saying the right words has guaranteed our entrance into heaven? Accepting Jesus Christ has nothing to do with casting spells. You know what accepting means according to the Bible? It is to gladly welcome him with all of your heart. But we're in big trouble. You know why? Because he came into the world as the light of the world. You know what light does? It sheds light on the darkness. Our sinfulness gets exposed. Our filthiness gets challenged. Our sins are going to be convicted. It's uncomfortable. When the light actually comes into darkness, it actually challenges you. It's going to make you very uncomfortable. It's inconvenient for us. That's why it's hard to accept him. We're not talking about, well, um, I, like, I like this Bible passage, and uh, I like what you're telling me. I like the gospel, and it probably feels more natural to me for me to uh, go to church as a Korean American. That's why I want to accept Jesus Christ. It, it's, it doesn't work like that. The word accepting Jesus Christ means welcoming him with joy and gladness. But like I said, it's not easy to welcome him, truly welcome him, all of him, with joy and gladness. Yeah, part of him, it's, it's not bad, because who doesn't like the message, oh, God loves you, God's going to bless you, God's going to mightily use you. Who doesn't like a message like that? Everybody likes it, right? But when it comes to other aspects of him, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, repent. Oh, well, um, that's making me uncomfortable. Don't you, do you realize a lot of times we've um, accepted only a part of Jesus? We've probably made him into something that he's really not. Do you remember um, in the Old Testament, the Bible actually describes God, the the Bible actually introduces our God as the consuming fire. I I really love that expression because it just sounds so powerful as it looks like, right? But what does it mean? What does it mean to... Uh, you know, what does it mean by uh, he's a consuming fire? I've always wondered as a little kid, why doesn't the Bible say, well, he's a, uh, he's a powerful water or he's like some kind of tsunami? That sounds more powerful, you know? you know? Fire gets extinguished by water, so water, therefore, is more powerful. But why does the Bible actually say he's a consuming fire? 
Let me tell you why. There's a difference between water and fire. You know what the difference is? Well, Pastor Daniel, water is liquid and fire <laughs> is fire. <laughs> well, water is cold, but fire is hot. Well, <laughs> this is not a children's sermon, so um, you got to think above that. What's the difference between water and fire? Let me tell you the difference. According to the Bible, looking at, looking at this passage from the context of what, tr- what the Bible is trying to tell us, the difference between water and fire is this. Water, the shape of water, is defined by the vessel. So if you put water into a round bowl, the water takes the form of that round bowl. If you put water into a bottle, the water takes the form of the bottle shape of the bottle, right? How about fire? Fire defines the shape of the vessel. When the Bible actually, when the Bible says the Lord is a consuming fire, you know what that means? When the Lord comes into your heart, and if you really truly want to have that fellowship with him, you can't maintain your shape of life. Lord, uh, I, I'm a professional and this is how far I'm going to go with my faith. And this is uh, good enough for me. Maybe once a week, church, that's good. Maybe twice, that's a little too much. But, you know, once a year, maybe that's okay during the holiday season. But if you ask, start asking me to come out every night and pray, uh, I'm not sure I'm going, to do, I'm going to be able to do that. You know what that is? You've made Jesus into something else. Our God is a consuming fire. That means, you know, if you want to have a fellowship with me, if you, if you want to have any kind of relationship with me, pick up your cross. Pick up, picking up your cross means submit yourself to me. There cannot be any limitations when it comes to knowing Jesus and accepting Jesus. And like I said, it's very uncomfortable to accept Jesus, truly accept Jesus, truly accept Jesus. Because when he comes to you, he's going to take you to places where that's going to be uncomfortable for you. Make you repent of the things that you don't want to repent. Make you stop the things that you don't want to stop. God's going to tell you not to go to certain places, not to carry on that unhealthy relationship. Well, uh, I wasn't expecting to hear that. Well, the light came into the world and the world did not like it. So what kind of Christianity do you have? Well, the, the Christianity I like is the warm and fuzzy Christianity, you know, makes everybody feel comfortable. Well, um, that, that's, that's the love, y'all, you know. That's, that's Christianity. But I'm going to tell you, that's only part of Christianity. Our God is loving and is full of grace and mercies, but at the same time, he is just, he's holy, he's righteous, there's a balance to it. To accept Jesus Christ means you're accepting the entirety. The entire Jesus. Is that what we're doing? Do you accept Jesus Christ with? Do you welcome him with joy and gladness? So that's the second question that we want to, we want to ask ourselves. So if there is anything that you cannot leave behind to follow after Jesus uh, you can pretty much tell yourself maybe you haven't even recognized him as, uh, as a Christ. Um, that therefore, you haven't even accepted him as Jesus, as Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why the way into the kingdom of God, you know what Jesus says one po- uh, at one point? He says the way into the kingdom of God is very, very narrow. A lot of people want to go into it, but only a few can enter by it. Don't you ever wonder, you know, why is this passage making coming to church so so difficult. I've always wondered that. You know, coming to church, you know, signing up that membership, you know, beginning disciple, that 10-week program, and attending that worship service and feeling warm and fuzzy and you know, shedding tears a few drops a week. And that made me that made me feel like I'm a Christian and feel loved. But according to the Bible, there's a there's a huge difference. There's a gap. The Bible actually says the narrow the, the way is very narrow. A lot of people want to enter by it, but only a few can enter into it. 
Don't you think there's a big difference between what we have and what the Bible is trying to tell us? Maybe this is a time for us to say, you know what? I want to seriously examine myself. Am I truly saved? Am I, do I really have eternal life? Do I know Jesus Christ? Do I really, have I really accepted Jesus Christ? Lastly, number three, do I believe in Jesus Christ? Um, I'm going to read this in, uh, from, from verses 7 through 12. Do I believe in Jesus Christ? Verse 7, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that, uh, to, he came to that which, of, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See that? To those who believed in his name, God has given them the right to become the children of God. So the question is, what what does it mean to believe? Believe. Uh, Well, I believe in the existence of God. Well, that's what so many other people do. But that's not exactly what the Bible is trying to say here. Our faith is more than believing the existence of God. Just because you don't believe in the, uh, believe in the, what is it, evolution theory, Big Bang theory, that doesn't make you a Christian. Just because, oh, maybe there is a creator God out there, that doesn't make you a Christian. That's only a small, small element of Christian faith. You know what, you know what the Bible is saying? Believe in his name means believe in his achievements, believe in his mercies, believe in his attributes, Believe in who he is, trust in him, and then God's going to give you the child. God's going to give you the right to become the children of God. In other words, let me translate that for you. You know, in other words, nothing we do can save ourselves. No works, no good works, no righteousness. Nothing we do will be able to guarantee our ways into into the kingdom of God. It's not what we do, but what, it's what he has done for us. Um, I um, travel as a missionary to different places, so I, a lot of people ask me this question. So, uh, Pastor Daniel, uh, why do Christians, non-Christians are asking these questions, um, why do Christians always say that they have the ultimate truth? Um, one day I start to think, you know, maybe i got to have a better way to explain this to um, these people because because. I go to the Islamic countries, I go to uh, communist countries, I go to places like Japan where there's about 8 million gods. If you go to those places, you, you, what, what makes your um, truth claim more valid over other truth claims? There's clashes of truth claims, right? So people ask me this question. Um, why, why, does Christi- why do Christians always say that they have the ultimate truth? So I started to think about it, um, and I began to see that there's two kinds of people in this world, two kinds of people. And a lot of you will probably automatically say, well, uh, those, two kinds of people, those two kinds of people must be Christians and non-Christians. No, they're not. Two kinds of people that I see are religious people and the gospel people. Religious people and the people that have placed their trust in Jesus Christ alone. So what is a religion? Religion. Gathering like this? No, this is a religious gathering. It's an adjective. What's a religion? Having a meeting like this? It's a religious worship. Adjective again. But what is a religion? Religion. I was so curious, I looked it up. You know what he says? Religion is anything or anyone that can help you to answer the big questions of life. And I started to wonder, what are those big questions of life? And the big questions are, where did I come from? Where am I going? What can I do to fill up this void in my heart? What can I do to feel like somebody? What can I do to feel like I matter in this world? What can I do to find a place in this world? Anything that we do, uh, anything that we use, to fill up that void, that's a religion. In that sense, in that sense, there is no atheist. 
You realize that? A lot of you, a lot of people say, "Well, I'm not a religious person. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a gospel person. Where do I belong? I'm an atheist." But I'm going to tell you, atheism is also religion. Why? Well, I don't believe in my, I don't believe in anything. Uh, I don't believe in anything else. I believe in myself. Well, there, there you go. That's that's a religion. But besides that, atheism is also serving that purpose because there is no one in this world that lives without a, that lives today uh, without a single religion in their lives. Everybody has some sort of religion. Yeah, different masks, different facades, but every single person has a religion. But largely divided, I think there's two kinds of religions in this world, two kinds of, two kinds of religions. One is organized form of religion. The other one is non-organized form of religion. Organized form of religion is the religions that we already know about, right? Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Catholicism. But all those religions say serve one purpose, it helps us, it, it, those, those religions help us to answer the big questions of life. If I serve Islam so diligently, maybe one day Allah's going to accept me into his kingdom. Well, that's a comforting message to hold on to, right? As you go through your life. Well, if I uh, live a good life as a, as a Buddhist, uh, you know, as a Buddhist, if I live a good life, maybe one day if I die and if I'm reborn, maybe I'm going to be reborn as a human. Well, that's comforting to know. That's, how you, that, that's the mechanism that you use to accept, your, to accept your life, to face your life. But besides that, there's other form of religion. What is that? Non-organized form of religion. Then these are the type of religions that you never thought would be religions. For example, your boyfriend. That could be a religion. It serves the same purpose. Well, if I can date a guy like this, maybe I'm somebody. Well, that's a religion. If I can have a job like that, maybe my life is not that bad. Well, that's a religion. Different masks. Do you realize? Different masks. But serving the exactly same purpose. Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Catholicism. Just like that. Your boyfriend, girlfriend, your job, your, how much you make. If I can make that much money, maybe my life is pretty successful. I can take that. Well, that's a religion. So every single religion, no matter what it looks like, every single religion serves one purpose. It helps you to deal with yourself. Well, if I serve like this, maybe I'm not that bad. Well, that's a religion. In fact, a lot of people come to church thinking that they're Christians, but they're just practicing the religion of Christianity. If I can tithe this, if I can tithe this much, maybe God's going to accept me. If I can serve like this, maybe I'm not wasting my life. You're using all those things to face yourself in the mirror. That's a religion. But as I looked at every single religion in this world, every single religion operates under one formula. Every single religion, it doesn't matter whether it's Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or boyfriend and girlfriend, it doesn't matter. Every single religion in this world operates under one formula. I call it the religious formula. It's an equation, give and take. Give and take. How does that apply? If you live a good life, you go to heaven. If you don't live a good life, you go to hell. If you live a good life, you'll be accepted. If you don't live a good life, you'll be rejected. Give and take. For example, Islam. I go to the Islamic countries a lot, and I see a lot of Muslims praying five times a day. As they're praying five times a day, there's a ritual that they do. Every time they pray, they turn to their right and they turn to their left. Do you realize that? As they're praying, they turn to their right and they turn to the left. And I was wondering, why do they turn? And this is, this is the Islamic theology. You know what, the, you know what they, they believe? They believe... For every human, two angels follow them around their entire lives. One angel follows them around, records all the good things that they do. The other angel follows them around, records all the bad things that they do. The day that they die, take all the good things and bad things, they weigh them. If you have more good things, you go to heaven. If you have more bad things, you go to hell. You hear that? Give and take. Give and take. If you live a good life, you go to heaven. If you don't live a, bad, if you don't live a good life, you go to hell. Give and take. Yeah, it's a big religion. It's a major religion. But, it's, but they're talking about the exactly same thing. How about Buddhism? 
well, a lot of people think Buddhism is so sophisticated. A lot of foreigners come to Korea. I want to do temple stay, yo. It's so sophisticated, so oriental, you know. So you come thinking, okay, you, you, can, you can somehow like, find the truth. But you know what Buddhism is pretty much saying? If you live a good life, don't hurt other people, don't commit crimes. One day you die, you're going to be reborn as a human. If you don't, you, you might be born as a cockroach. Give and take. I'm not making this up, am I? That's pretty much the bottom line of you know, all these religions. How about your girlfriend? How about your boyfriend? Give and take. Well, my girlfriend will never leave me. Wake up. <laughs> my girlfriend left me. I don't think there is really anything such as unconditional, unconditional love in this world. Even the closest love to the love of God in this world like even the love of parents, you know what the Bible says? Even if your father and mother leave you, I'll never leave you. You know what that means? No love on earth is going to be unconditional. So every single thing in this world is conditional. Everything is give and take. If you do well, I'll accept you. I'll love you up to that point. But if you fail, I got to rethink. How about your job, your company? When you're performing, yeah, we love you. But if you fail to meet that quota, what happens? Well, we've got to let you go. Give and take. But you know what the sad thing is? A lot of people treat Christianity, our Christian faith, just like that. If I come to church, maybe this way I can avoid God curse, placing a curse on me. If I come on Sunday, maybe my rest of the week's going to be okay. If I give offerings to the church, maybe God's going to bless my business. If I come uh, to the sunrise service every morning, my children's going to be able to enter Harvard. You know, all this is Korean, Korean mentality. Anyways, <laughs> a lot of us have that religiousness in us. But I'm going to tell you, there are a second type of people in this world. Who are they? The gospel people, the people who have placed their trust in the Lord. The gospel, the gospel is the power of God that breaks the curse of the law. Gospel is the power of God that unleashes us from the slavery of religion. While we were still sinners, Christ died for our sins. The religion will tell you, the religion will tell you, live like this. Do the right thing. Perform. Then I'll bless you. Then I'll accept you. Then I'll save you. But the gospel says, no matter how hard you try, you'll never be able to get there. You tried, but you can't even forgive your own brother. You tried, but you can't even let go of that grudge against your father. No matter how hard you, how hard you try, there's really no way that you can actually get rid of that uh, addiction that you have in your life. But we're, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And more you realize how much you're loved by God and you place your trust in him, that's when your life is slowly and slowly transformed because of the grace that he has bestowed on your life. That's what, that's what the gospel is. That's what it means to place your trust in him. That's what it means to believe in his name. I'm going to finish... I'm going to finish up with this one story. It's just a, it's, it's a story of my father. He's still alive, so don't worry. It's, uh, it's the story of my father. And uh, he's, an old, he's an old man now. But um, I really respect him because of, um, because, um, his, because of who he is. Um, he has actually shown me. He has actually shown me what the gospel message can do in a man's life. As a little kid, I've... I didn't know what my father did for a living. Um, I was living in Korea, and uh, I was um, I, I lived in not, not I lived not too far from here, uh, up to age ten. And uh, like I was introduced, I'm not Korean American. I am Korean Japanese, but to be more specific, I am a TCK, a third culture kid. Um, I was born in Korea. I, I lived in Korea until I was ten. And at age 10, I moved to Japan, where my father was born and raised. So my father is a Japanese, a Korean Japanese sansei. He's a third generation Korean Japanese. So even till now, 
My father doesn't speak Korean. So with my father, I have to speak Japanese. But because of the language barrier, um, I've never known what my father did for a living. Um, he was speaking Japanese. He was living in Japan at that time. I was living in Korea. I was only speaking Korean. So when we meet, the only way for us to communicate is through the body language. So like even for like simple things such as, you know, do you want to do you want to have an ice cream? My dad would actually use his entire body to express that question, right? So <laughs> that's how you talk. Like very intimate conversation, right? <laughs> so that's why I I don't know anything about my father. But my father would actually come and visit me uh, once or twice a month to you know, see me. But the rest of the time, um, he was living in Japan because he felt more comfortable running business in Japan because he spoke Japanese. Anyways, um, at age 10, I moved to Japan. I started living with my father. Um, so that's when my entire family got together. And, uh, we moved from Kyoto, Japan, to Fukuoka. That's where I was raised. And uh, soon, I started to pick up Japanese. I started to um, I began to um, speak to my father in Japanese, and we were able to communicate. That's when my father told me what he used to do for a living. He um, he was a former member of Japanese yakuza, a Japanese mafia. Um, so I'm an MK, not a missionary kid, but I'm a mafia kid. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. I'm an MK. Some people would totally misunderstand that, so they call me to the MK nest, thinking I'm a missionary kid. I'm not. Anyways, my father, uh, he was uh, I mean, Japanese Makusa. It's, it's, there's a lot of different syndicates. There's a, one major syndicate is Yamaguchi Syndicate, Yamaguchi clan. That's the largest. And uh, it, there's a lot of people, the members of that. Um, it, it's, um, there are a lot of people working for them. And uh, although there's about um, 100,000 members of Yamaguchi clan throughout Japan, uh, only 90 people are brothers and, uh, brothers and families. Uh, only 90 people are considered uh, families. And uh, those 90 people are actually scattered throughout Japan, people that are in charge of each city, for example, Tokyo uh, Syndicate, or um, Kyoto Syndicate, Fukuoka Syndicate, or Nagoya Syndicate. Um, the, the headquarter, HQ, is in Kobe. And that's where the Kaicho, the, 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 the main guy, the godfather, the boss lives. He's an old man, so he doesn't run everything by himself. So he actually entrusted um, every single region to uh, number twos. So my father has been um, the guy who's uh, in charge of Kyoto region for about 40 years. My mother had no idea that he was a Yakuza like that. So they had arranged marriage. So I think my mother, my grandmother kind of messed up uh, introducing her daughter into this <laughs> family, right? He must be a nice man. Anyways, they got married and that's when my mother's life started to get really, um, enter into a time of difficulty. Uh, anyways, um, that's why, now I think about it, now, now, now I know why my mother uh, had to pray like that. She was praying so much that my father would one day come to know Christ. But one day, um, I remember um, as a little kid, my father um, hasn't shown up for about two years before I came to Japan. You know, usually once or twice a month, he would come and visit me in Korea. But I think when I was about six or five years old, he stopped coming to visit me for about two years. And I would ask my mom, uh, Mom, when's dad coming? And my mom would say, oh, he's going to come soon. But for two years, I haven't seen my dad. But after he told me that he was a former Yakuza member, he told me um, his conversion story, how he uh, came out of Yakuza and how he became a Christian and how he left the whole syndicate and how he started his new life in Fukuoka. And uh, I realized during those two years, it wasn't because he didn't want to see me, but he was in Japan. Um, he was going through a trial. He was in prison. And I remember, that's why my mother wrote so many letters to him. Every single night, my mother would write letters to him. The, the content of the letter is the gospel message. Believe in his name, return to him. Believe in his name, get trust in his name, return to him. My, my father would write to her, how can I? 
I cannot be forgiven for what I've done. And my mother would write to him, it's not what you have done that matters. Uh, it, it's, it, it's what Jesus has done for us already on the cross. Just return to him. Return to us. We're going to be here waiting for you. Our new life's going to be waiting for you. God has great plans for your life. Just return. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. And one day, after stacks of letters, my father decided to accept Jesus Christ into, heart, into, his, into his life. He was still in prison. He was in, still in jail. He was still in that um, Japanese, uh, not orange, but not stripes, but Japanese prison clothes. He still had a number on his chest. But that's when he accepted Jesus Christ. Not because he changed. God accepted him. The way he was, the, the way he was, as the way he is, he just accepted, accepted Jesus Christ into his life. And that night, he... Um, the way he converted, the way he accepted Jesus Christ into his life, uh, I think probably the best way to describe this is um, maybe he, uh, he had that samurai mentality of um, accepting Jesus. He felt like he can't even kneel down before him because I don't even deserve to kneel down before you. So he stood up in reverence, and he felt like I don't even deserve to cover myself up, all my filthiness with this clothes. So he just stripped himself in the, in the in prison cell. He was naked with maybe a little bit of underwear. And he was standing up, and all night, in tears, he accepted Jesus Christ into his life. The following morning, as the sun was rising up, the first word that came out of his mouth is this, as I'm forgiven much, and I'm going to love you much. You know what the difference between religion and Christianity is? Religion and gospel is? The religion will say, you love me much, then you'll be forgiven. But the gospel says, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's how God proved his love for us. And if, you're, if you begin to realize how much you're forgiven, if you begin to realize what Christ has already done for us on the cross, your life's going to be changed. Religion, you perform, therefore you're forgiven. The gospel, you're forgiven, therefore you perform completely different. So where do you want to place your trust? Your good deeds, your effort, the things that we, do, we think we can do for God? None of those things matter. Those things come after your heart is transformed because of his love. Is that where you're standing? Are you saved? Are you, do you have eternal life? Let us pray together.